fun. The ladies are here. We are observing uh, COVID-19 protocols, as you know. So everybody's a little spaced out. They do have their masks. I'm worried that I don't have mine, but if I have a on, uh, I don't think I'll be audible. So, yes, without further ado, I'd like us to uh, just welcome Munira, who's going to welcome us and just open the proceedings this morning. Uh, Munira, I want you guys to check the chairperson of the footballing girls. The reason why we're all here today, it's a great idea to having us uh, getting here. In Thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much each and every one of you who are here today for sharing this day with us. It was a very last minute. I think we thought we were done with all our events for the year. But uh, I always say my team is going to run away from this soon. But always gay, always here to do what needs to be done for the empowerment of women um, through the different initiatives that we do. And I think today is more about being you, irrespective of your surroundings, your circumstance just being you and fighting for you and fighting for what you want so we hope today uh got amazing speakers i mean um i met the M and michelle michelle sorry when i did um, a presentation for the global women empower summit and that's how we got to meet and that's how we got to network and i called them up and i was like hey guys listen i'd like to do this would you be interested and there was there was the moment's hesitation. It was like, yeah, sure, when send this information, let's do this. And that's the kind of support we need as women. You know, whether I'm in South Africa, she's in the UK, she's in the US, it doesn't really matter. But the fact that we are here to support each other and to empower each other, that's what today is all about. I hope you have a good time. I hope you are empowered by the time you leave here. Um, Mimi and I go way, way, way back. I think it's over 10 years now. Um, I met her when she was already in the wheelchair, which is as stubborn as they come, but as fierce as they come. I have never come across a woman who is so resilient and never allows her situation to define her. Thank you very much, Munira, for being here with us today. Thanks, ladies. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Munira. Um, I wanted to leave our very last speaker who was, was in here with us to introduce her last because she's got such an incredible story and journey to share with us and that is Miranda Lipoko um, and she's going to share some of her views and perspective and she is on a wheelchair but it was by complete accident so to speak but it is her story to tell I won't delve too much into it and what she's able to do in terms of what anybody else would, how anybody else will look at it is absolutely incredible. Um, just hearing a little bit of a story, I said to her, there's no way I would overcome half what you've overcome, what you've overcome. So um, I'm so glad that you could be here with us this morning, sharing your story with some of the international speakers as well. So thank you, Brenda. Okay, without further ado, I'd like uh, M to start and open up proceedings. Uh, what do you have there from the UK for us, M, this morning? Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be connected uh, to all of you. Uh, we all sound like inspirational women. You look very, very glamorous, I must say. So um, I wish I'd uh, put something nice to run now. <laughs> um, um, so I wanted to share a little bit about my journey and my struggles because a lot of the time when people speak to me or Google me or look at me on social media, they think that my life's been pretty easy and um, I'm having a great time and it's all pretty glamorous, but actually it's been really tough and I've faced so many barriers and people don't really necessarily see that. And it's because of those barriers uh, is why I decided to uh, start and founded a, a UK registered charity called Rising Girl, which was actually inspired by Michelle Obama because she does Girl Rising. And I just thought, this is phenomenal. I and mean, she doesn't work in the UK. And I thought, she's an absolute inspiration. What can I, what, you know, what can I take away from what she has, she has already done? And it's all about education and allowing girls to rise through education. So I've got a small presentation that I've quickly put together that I'm going to share with you right now. Um, so Rising Girl, what are we about? We're all about inspiring, empowering and educating um, 
We actually work in schools in the United Kingdom uh, with girls aged between 11 and 18. Um, what we actually did right at the beginning is, um, I don't believe that you should do something that somebody else is doing, rather than I think you should support that person so they can become a bit bigger and better. Um, it's not about reinventing the wheel. So we do a lot of research to, to see what is the issue that is stopping girls from rising in education, dropping out of education at 16, and just not making anything of their lives. And we found that there's some really serious issues like domestic violence, forced marriage, honor-based violence, mental health issues, child sex education, which are actually stopping these girls from continuing on in education. Not that they necessarily face it themselves, but they may, uh, but they may have seen it or they may have uh, experienced it indirectly at home. So that's something that we really were really keen to kind of explore further and try and see if we can actually help these girls. So a little bit about me first. So why did I start Rising Girl? Well, um, a lot of you may or may not know um, my story. And to be perfectly honest with you, uh, I'm a mom. I'm a mom of uh, a young boy. Uh, a lot of people always uh, need to sit down and brace themselves before I tell them how old he is. Um, so I got married very, very, very young. Um, and unfortunately, um, I was married to a great person and I suffered domestic violence, uh, more mental than uh, uh, physical. Uh, and, but along came my son, who is now 18 at, at one of the best um, Ivy League universities. But that's another single mother story that I'll share with you another, another time. But um, what I did very recently, now that my son's all grown up, is I decided to open up about my barriers. So um, you've probably heard of a magazine called Hello Magazine. Um, so I, I they ended up doing a triple page um, spread about my story and what, what I faced. And so I opened up about my TV, I opened up about the issues that I faced when I was younger. And when I was growing up, um, my so I explained, I basically um, explained what was and what I was doing. But I said, what do you want to do? You know, when you leave school, are you going to go on? Are you going to be a doctor? Are you going to be an engineer? What, what do you want to do? And all of those girls turned around to me and said, well, actually, we're just going to finish school. We're going to get married and we're going to have children. They had absolutely no aspirations. So I spent 20 minutes with them talking about the fact that they could actually be someone. Uh, and then I met this one girl, and um, you might have seen her picture right at the bottom. Um, she's wearing a red scarf. Um, she said, Look, I live on top of that mountain, um, really come from a disadvantaged family. Um, but it, I risked my life um, because we walk down the mountain with the snakes and all kinds of things to come to school so that um, I can actually uh, rise and I can be a doctor and I can help my family out of poverty. So using my journalistic skills, I told her story in a four minute film which went viral and then I thought okay um, I've done my bit now and I called the film Rising Girl not knowing at the time that I would start a charity called Rising Girl. Um, after the, the amazing response that I received from the film I decided uh, and I was actually quite encouraged to start a charity um, and so I thought I might as well start right here at home um, where there's so many girls facing so many barriers before I decide to go you know across across the globe. So that's kind of, that's kind of where Rising Girl started and why I started Rising Girl ambassadors and the Rise Together ambassadors so that we teach them about leadership um, and so they can speak to the media on our behalf, they can speak to members of parliament and they can really rise. Now um, some of the girls and, and some people find this quite shocking because we're in the United Kingdom and it's one of the richest countries in the world um, but we have lots of pockets of areas across the United Kingdom where um, there's so much deprivation. So before starting and sharing my journey, I would like to say my heart goes out to all the victims that have departed. May their soul rest in peace. And to the survivors, I'd like to say, let's continue fighting, helping the sisters that are suffering in their relationships. As Lebu has said that I'm going to be sharing my personal journey, I was not born disabled. So I've got an opportunity of having two lives. I had an able life, now I'm having a disabled life. I was married for 18 years, I mean for eight years, and the marriage where I was experiencing emotional abuse, where I was married to a partner that was not able to communicate, and he had insecurities. And after suffering all those emotional abuse and I realized that I am not happy 
I am dying in this marriage. I'm losing myself. I'm losing my self-esteem. And I had to make a decision of moving out. I left him. It was a year and three months when I took that decision of moving out. And he called me to say I need to come back home. He has changed. He would stop his issues of not trusting me. And I believed him because I still loved him. I was convinced. I went back. A few months down the line, we're still fighting, fighting about the very same issues. And I realized that I'm not happy. I'm losing myself because our personalities were way opposite. I'm this outgoing, bubbly person, and he's this person that's homely. For him, we happy if I'm not going anyway. If I start saying Lebu has invited me, then it's an issue to him. I'm with someone out there. And it got worse to a point when I decided to move away from home. And I said, I'm leaving him. And I had left him and I moved back to my parents' place. But it was that particular day when I went home. Because he had called me that there was an issue with the kids. And I had to go and check it. So when I got there, unfortunately, it was one of those days. Because even in our previous fights, he used to tell me that if I leave him, he's going to kill the boy. So that day I went, but he was not even sure that I was I'll be coming that day. It was just coincident that when I got there, he was not there. But as I was about to leave, because I couldn't even gain access in that house, because the locks were changed. And then when I was about to leave, and then I saw his car coming on the driveway. And you know, when I approached him, because remember he had moved back home. So when I went to greet him, I could pick up that the mood was not right. And when I went to him to greet him, the response he gave me, it gave me affirmation that I've made a mistake of coming. And he said to me, it's good that you came because you're not going anywhere. We're both going to die. And to me, it was like, he always says that when he's angry. Maybe it's just one of those days. But unfortunately, that day was different. We started fighting. We were fighting on our driveway. My friends that I was traveling with were parked at the gate. The neighbors were also alert that we are fighting. They tried to call the police, but the police were never on the scene. And until one of my friends reached out on my bed that was left in the car, and they called my dad. My dad had to drop everything, and he came. For me, that was a huge relief that somebody was coming for my rescue. And when my dad was there, it was just a short conversation to say, you know, Amimi has left, he has come back home, but not even once you've called to come and say, what is the problem? Maybe just gather your family, we'll sit down and see how we're going to resolve your issue. And by that time, I just moved away some few steps going to my dad's car. And when I was still waiting for my dad to come and open for, him, for me on the passenger door because it was locked, and when I just turned my head to look at him, that's when he was pointing a gun at me. If I had the first shot, the second shot, I was looking right in his eyes. And as I fell, it came to me that he's been saying it, that he's going to shoot, shoot me one day. And this day has come. And I think the third bullet, he shot me with the third bullet was while I was on the ground because I became unconscious. When I regained conscious a few minutes later, I was lying there and there were feet on top of my head. And now I was worried. I thought maybe it was my dad trying to come and save me. And I started screaming for my friends and neighbors to come and assist me because I couldn't be moved with my head. And when I called out for Sandy and Toby to come and move the legs, when they came to lift the legs and realized when, the, when I saw the pants and shoes, that my husband has killed himself on the scene because he thought that I was dead and then he shot himself and died on the scene. Then I was moved to hospital. I was in coma for eight days. When I woke up, I was there. I could recall what has happened during the scene, but I wasn't sure what was happening about me. I couldn't move my legs, but I, when I, every time when I look at them, and I'm like, but my feet are here, so why can't I? It was only on Monday, because when I came out of coma, it was a Saturday. 
And then it was only on Monday when I was told that all the three bullets went into my spine and the damage they did, I won't be able to walk again. I guess my feeling froze that day because I couldn't even cry. And the doctor had to ask me, do you really understand what I'm telling you? And I said, yes, I do. Because I've been asking myself, why can't I move my legs? But now with you telling me this, then it explains to me. And now, when I also find out that the very same Saturday when I came out of coma, that it was his funeral, to me, that showed me that God is in power. Because to me, that was an exchange of life. When he was going down, I came back to life. And here I am today. It was not easy. I think it was after five days when reality sinked in. And I cried that day when I realized that my life has changed completely. And I cried in the afternoon. I asked myself that I've been crying the whole day. Is it changing my situation? It wasn't. I had to accept. And it was so unfortunate because I didn't have a relative or a friend that was disabled that I could relate to and say, you know, I've seen them. Lego manages well around the blockchain. This whole situation was new to me. But you know, God gave me a strength of acceptance. I accepted on that day and I moved on. When I say my presence is unshakable, yes, it's because this wheelchair doesn't define. It didn't take me away. It didn't take my personality away. I always say it took my mobility but it didn't take me away. It was not an easy transition. Remember, I was able yesterday, today, money. I had to adjust from sitting, I couldn't sit. For me, at physio, just to be trained to sit was a big achievement. And it got to a point where I had to be discharged and move back home. And when I was home, I remember, I would sit there, if I'm tired, I'll be put in the bed and I'll be asking myself, is this going to be my new life now? And I said, no. I called my boss and I said, I want to come back to work. And everybody was in shock and saying, no, it's way too early. You cannot be coming back now. And I said, guys, if you want me to sink into depression, you're going to let me stay at home. But give me a chance. I'm not sure if I'm going to go, but give me a chance. I want to come back. And yes, I took that challenge. I went back. It was never easy, but I adjusted. And nine months later, I decided, I told my parents that I'm going back to my house. And everybody thought I was losing my mind. And my doctor, when I told my doctor, I said, I'm going back to my house. He said, you cannot be going back to the same place where the whole shooting took place. And I said, give me a chance. If I'm not coping, I'm going to sell the house. If I can tell you today, it's 14 years later, I'm still staying in the same house. So, you know, I, I just want to send a message across that in whatever situations that we face with, it all needs acceptance. We can overcome it. We all have our stories in our corners. And we all die in our corners because we can't speak up. I'm here, I want to say, can we build sisterhood among ourselves? Can we reach out to each other? I know we are scared that if I share my story with Lebu, Lebu is going to start telling everyone. But those days are over. We need to speak up. I always say that I'm not even afraid of sharing my story. It's up to you what you say after us. But for me, that has been my healing therapy every time I go out there to inspire women about my story. And if I able to heal from that, I'm thinking that I'm also helping you. I'm not sure what you're going through, but by me sharing my story, I know I'm touching somewhere. I might not be touching direct, but you might be knowing a friend or a sister that you can reach out to and assist. Today, I've started an organization called Brain Change that organization, we are the two co-founders, we both own wheelchairs. 
It's because we felt that there's a need who gives support to survivors. No one gives support to survivors. We are left, we are scared. Who do we talk to? I always say that the perpetrators can get help from prison. But what about our parents that experience the trauma that we see? The survivors that are left scared. So with the, our organization, mostly we focus on women and young girls with disability because that's the most vulnerable group and no one is paying attention. We talk about women and young girls, but we talk about the ones with physical disability because that they, they are the ones that suffer abuse mostly because you find that women are being abused by their counterparts because they fully depend on them. You find that girls are being abused by their caregivers. The very same person that is taking care of you is the very same person that abuses you. And where do you get the power to report that person? So in our organization, we create that safe space where women and young girls can be able to talk and be able to speak up and boost their self-esteem so that they can be able to have the self-representation whenever they go and report cases because you find that there's so many cases that are out there but they are not reported. So lastly, they will in closing so that I don't take much time. Can I just ask this one exercise? I guess everybody's got a phone here. Mm -hmm. Can we please check out our phones and put it on the selfie mode? <laughs> <laughs> I want you ladies to tell me what do you see as you're looking at that. What is it that you see as you're looking at in your phone? A fierce woman. A strong woman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we agree that you see a beautiful self when yeah. you see on those phones. Yeah. You, you see a confident self mm -hmm. on your phones. You see a happy self on those phones. So you don't need affirmation for, from everyone to yes. tell you that you are beautiful. You need to be able to wake up in the morning and tell you that you are beautiful. And I always say that happiness doesn't need the spotlight to shine. It reflects from within. So you don't get destroyed about what people say, but you get destroyed about what you say to yourself. So I would leave you with the message that speak positive to yourself. I always say that I may be paralyzed, but my spirit is not broken. Sure. Under professionals who then branched out to start my own company, it came from a, a lot of different sources, but I have a company as an entrepreneur, as a tech investor, um, and as a philanthropist. I have a, a company I started, which is Silverstone International, and a company um, during this whole social justice, we started a company, 4C Incorporated, to help force I mean, C-suite's executives around unconscious and bias that are uh, plaguing <clears throat> our organizations to this day with diversity and inclusion, which is at the highest of most. But what I'm here today to talk about is Silverstone International. Silverstone International is a uh, management um, firm that focuses on sporting, uh, sporting, sporting opportunities around um, multi-digital um, media platform. We have almost in recent years um, <laughs> developed how athletes are performing faster and stronger under um, technology-based performances that we have um, worked with some of our counterparts um, in Asia on developing a lot of opportunities so uh, of revenue. And I was tasked with an opportunity of developing uh, 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 um, soccer within HBC and also um, creating the Title IX uh, portfolio by making sure women were included in the um, sports package of, of soccer. So that opportunity of platform allowed me 
to move around in places that I never thought um, that I would be. Uh, so in that, um, and I won't go into a long story about it, but in that, we all know that soccer um, is a 3.5 billion reach. And in the U.S., you know, soccer is, is growing, but at that time, Soccer was not a sport that was growing at the revenue and the rate that it's growing now. So I was allowed to interface with a lot of different um, individuals. And one of the uh, people uh, that I was tasked to host as we were planning the um, development and strategic committee for NCAA soccer uh, championship, there was a group that was coming over from Germany. And in that group, um, since I grew up in Europe, in Germany, as a military brat, I spoke and I speak uh, German, so I was asked to go and help with the delegation. And within that delegation, I met a, a gentleman who, at the time, I didn't know. And it came out to be Franz Beckenbauer. Franz Beckenbauer, as many of you know, was hosting the 2006 World Cup. Um, invited me over as a part of the logistics team. And I ended up meeting a lot of different folks and 